uh, that is so <coughs> structured that it can handle international conferences and all the other activities that we may need. So we want you to come up just to see what women who put their minds and hearts together uh, can achieve. A multi-million dollar uh, center uh, in uh, New Jersey will host the conference, the 23rd, uh, the board meeting and reception on the Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday, um, half a day Sunday, and then Sunday afternoon, evening will be Jeffrey's Day. Um, take advantage of, of my home folks uh, knowing what we're doing on the Pan-African uh, playing field, battlefield, and uh, so we're going to make that a weekend to remember. So try to get your resources together and join us. Uh, we also have various other leaders um, uh, here, and certainly uh, one of the brothers that uh, was here yesterday and he's back today is uh, leaders from the Hebrew Israelite community uh, in Domona. They're in the house. Let me see those brothers. <laughs> Those of you who wish to have the conference program, our advertisement will be out at the table that Brother Small and I have in the back. So you'll be able to get the information you need and we'll also uh, give you any other details. Now yesterday, in terms of the political dimensions of our workshop, I had a chance to uh, speak uh, before we broke up into workshops to outline a charge of what we were why we're here, what we're all about. And that charge is to take the Pan-African struggle and movement to new, newer and higher and greater levels. And we outline some of the history of our movement together and some of the difficulties we've faced. Because clearly these are the worst of times in terms of the condition of our people, particularly mental slavery. These are the worst of times for education systems that are falling apart. These are the worst of times that are families that can't stay together. These are the worst of times when we don't have our personal identities <coughs> together, don't know which side of the equation, male or female, we fall on. These are the worst of times because too many of our young people are heading into the jail system. These are the worst of times because the, the venting of black people, the invasion, the attack uh, all over the world is continuing unabated with high sophisticated technology now. But these are the best of times if African peoples can come together. These are the best of times if we understand who and what we are. These are the best of times if we understand what's in our hands, what's in our lands, what our potentials are, really are. And so if we maximize that which we have, we can deal with the crisis that we face. And so the political dimension is very important. We're not starting with a, a blank slate. There's plenty on the table. Others have thought through these problems. Coming down here on the plane, I brought with me the destruction of black civilization, Chancellor Williams, reading it for the umpteenth time, seeing new dimensions in it. Chancellor Williams' work, the destruction of black civilization, has to be on your table as you deal with the future of African peoples. Chancellor Williams represents a school of knowledge. Read his various works, The Rebirth of uh, African Civilization. When you look at Dr. Baird, Dr. Clark, uh, Dr. Diep, and the rest of our scholars, Dr. Hillier, uh, Dr. Amos Wilson, see them as schools of knowledge. Look at their various works that they've put in publication. Listen to their various tapes and DVDs. Also, understand the personal developments that they have, the commitments that they made, the sacrifices that they made to be on this Pan-African path. Because it would have been easy for many of us to have taken the Negro path, the Negro achieving path, and become very wealthy and very comfortable. But those on the, the pioneering path of continuing to pull our people together worldwide have to be prepared to make the sacrifices. And we, we've made them. But these are the best of times because as I look over the next, over the past 50 years, I have what I call my 50 year turning point of history in favor of African peoples and peoples of color. 1945 to 1995, crucial historical period for our peoples. In 1945, some of our greatest minds met together at the Manchester Pan-African Conference to outline a way for our peoples 
The European world system had collapsed in and on itself once again. It collapsed in World War I when tens of millions of Europeans were killing each other. It collapsed economically in the Great Depression. And then it collapsed again in World War II when millions of Europeans were killing each other. It's not just a question of gas chambers and ovens in Nazi Germany. There were deaths and destructions all over Europe and other parts of the world with this European system collapsing in and on itself. And at that time, they were restructuring in 1945 the rebuilding of the European system. So they met in San Francisco and mapped out uh, the so-called United Nations. They met in other places and put together the Atlantic uh, Charter. And they met in other places and put together the North Atlantic Treaty. So the European world was restructuring itself to take control of the planet once again. But African peoples were meeting in Manchester and saying it's, not, it's a new day. There's going to be a new formulation. There's going to be a new plan. Our African peoples are going to try to pull together their economics, their politics, and their culture to produce a system capability to liberate our people. And so the Nkrumahs, the Azikaways, the Ross McConnans from, from Guyana, the Padmores, uh, the W.E.B. Du Boises, the Paul Robinsons, the wife of Marcus Garvey, and a host of others met to map out a new program for African peoples. And we're in that tradition. We're taking it to new heights. This is nothing new. This is a continuation of the liberation process of Africans. And so Africans began to think politically in a new domain, a new way, economically in a new way, and culturally in a new way. Our great contributions have added to that. We need to see where we fit in this uh, master plan of African liberation and Pan-Africanism. The new nation building took place with the liberation movements in the 50s and the 60s. New economic program of African peoples to pull together our, our resources. Some people went for African socialism. Some people went for Marxist-Leninism. Some people went for African communalism. But there were new formulations being uh, laid out. The greatest difficulty that we faced is we lost our mind. We laid out a political, pro an economic program. We laid out a political program, but we lost our minds. And the greatest contribution that we have made, Africans who are conscious of this, is to help find the African mind and free it from the fetters, from the chains of European uh, mental slavery. And so when we meet at Morehouse, and at Southern Island, that's a part of the process uh, that we're about. And so all of us are making important contributions, and we need to know where we fit. Now, a particular political charge that we were given is that the organization that came out of trying to unify African nations, the Organization of African Unity, that El Haj Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, attempted to put a compliment to when he created the OAAU. That process of political coming together is continuing now at a new level. The OAU has refashioned itself into the AU, the African Union. And the African Union has done an assessment based upon the debris the ashes of the death of our peoples that has gone on these last 50 years. Failed states, genocide, corruption, disease. And after analyzing what has been the reality, they've come up with new formulations and new directions that we have to try to contribute to. For one, the mini state of the African world is not capable of taking upon the task of leading us into the 21st century and beyond. The mini state of the Caribbean is not a state. That's right. It is not capable of delivering for their people. That's right. The mini states of Africa are not sufficiently capable of delivering on the world stage. They have to be refashioned. That's right. And the African American population has to restructure itself so that it becomes a super state on the African world stage instead of these many municipalities that we now have. So we have to get out of the box and rethinking and refashioning our future. The African Union has called for a dialogue on where we need to go. So in October 2004, they called for a meeting most unusual of African intellectuals and African leadership to join together in a week of brainstorming, think tank process 
for Africanization of our world. And what was decided was that every so-called intellectual with a degree from Harvard, Yale, and Columbia would not be there. So there was not, there was not an invitation extended to Cornell West. A friend of mine and a friend of yours, but Dr. Clark described him best. And we need to look at these things in a very hard way. Dr. Clark and his love for Cornell, but wanted to reach out for him to Africanize him, said Cornell seems to be 10 miles wide and three feet deep. And I hate to lay that on you, but we don't have to do it. Because a lot of our people are mesmerized by the slick talk and by the walk. And they don't understand that there has to be some depth to this struggle. And certainly an invitation was not extended to our friend and our brother, dislocated as he is. Henry Lewis skipped the truth gates. The invitation was not extended to him. was not extended to, to Dyson. Uh, and all these who have now taken their role without paying a price of strength. The invitation was extended to Tony Martin, Dr. Tony Martin. The invitation was extended to Dr. Matthew Santo. An invitation was extended to Professor James Moore. An invitation was expensive, extended to Dr. Wade Nobles. An invitation was extended to Dr. Uh, uh, Theophil Banger. An invitation was extended to Dr. Ruth Love. An invitation was extended to our brother uh, in the Bay Area uh, with his team of people, Dr. Oberta Chapman. And so an invitation was extended to my wife and I. And many of the African scholars of commitment on the African continent and from the Caribbean. So they self-selected those who were on this pair. They didn't ask every African leader. Some of those who bumped into leadership because of the stupidity of our culture and what we're doing and took leadership. I'm talking about people in Sierra Leone, military people who wanted boots and who came down to Freetown to demand boots and the political leadership thought they were calling for a coup and they left the country and these military leaders who wanted boots uh, had taken over Sierra Leone. That type of leadership, by accident and stupidity, was not invited. So we had military leadership that had been committed. That brother from the Gambia, that young brother, couldn't come but he sent, Jean-Mais, he couldn't come but he sent his female woman vice president, who is very together. Uh, the brother who was the president of Mali, of uh, Konare, who is now taking the leadership of coordinating these things, the former president of Mali, the president of Wad, Awad, uh, uh, welcomed us. Uh, you had Mbeke, who stands on a tradition of struggle. Uh, Nelson Mandela came by via the telephone, uh, the media, and so did our brother uh, Gaddafi. So they selected the African leadership, Museveni and others, that have a commitment to where we're needing to go. And then this brainstorming took place. And out of it came this that the political leadership of Africa needs to reorganize itself. Museveni said that he did not think and he did not want to get in bed with some of these crazy political leaders. But he did feel comfortable with the leaders in his region who he had worked with for years. So he thinks that the formula should be a regionalization of the African continent. The East African region, the Southern African region, the Central African region, the West African region, and the North African region. But economically, he said, we need to have a political, a economic union of Africa economically. The question of citizenship was, uh, was raised. We need to have not an individual citizenship to states, but a continental-wide citizenship. The questions of reparations was raised, and we need to put that as a collective process on the international stage. But the question, the question of our position, and this is what I want to end with, Brother Melanie, you got, I can't stop in midstream. You didn't even tell me what you wanted me to do, and I'm here trying to figure out what to make your contribution. Let me finish my damn question. <laughs> Let me leave you with this, because we're going to come back to report to you tomorrow. And this may be the most important thing that was raised. Museveni is a Economist. Wad is an economist. And Wad explained that as head of a state, when he took position 
uh, Powell in Senegal, he was given documents to sign. And normally the president signs it, but he said, wait a minute, what are these documents? They said, don't worry about it, just sign it. He said, no, no, I have to read it, I have to analyze it. Come to find out these were documents that he was supposed to sign without reading. Mineral concessions to Europeans that they get 90% of the wealth and 10% goes to Senegal. And he explained that he, believed, he did not sign it, and he believes, and he said to, the, to us, that if this generation of leaders believes that 90% of the wealth should go to the European and 10% to the African, then we should leave the damn wealth in the ground and wait for a generation that understands what happened to the African wealth, to the world. Then the 70, an economist, looked at our community and said, my reflection on our world in terms of analyzing is that we're not using our wealth properly. Africa has disposable income to the tune of $550 billion. $147 billion coming from South Africa. $49 billion coming from oil in Nigeria. $30 billion coming from cotton and cocoa in Uganda. $24 billion coming from phosphate and peanuts in Senegal. A total of disposable income of 550 billion. Brother Small and I looked at each other from where we were in the hall. We looked at great nobles and others. African Americans started communicating that the disposable income of African peoples in America is almost twice the disposable income of the whole continent of Africa with all the diamonds, the gold, the uranium, the platinum, the titanium. And if we can use our disposable wealth in any meaningful way, we could transform Africa. And because of that, the AU has now asked us to form a sixth region yes, to be a part of the plan for African world in the future. That's what I was going to say. I didn't see you raising your hand. 
Come on now, come on now. An army of Africans to make sure that this great leader is elected. Give some love to Dr. Sherwood Lewis again. Dr. Sherwood Lewis. Also, we have Minister Akbar Muhammad. Give him some love. That's right. The reason why I wanted this minister up here is because he spent so much time in our motherland. And so he has a lot to share in terms of that African Union. You have Baba Asa Hillard making his way up and Baba Jeffries stepping down. Give Baba Jeffries some love and give Baba Asa Hillard some love. And now we have the great Ilona Brath of the Pratis Lumumba Coalition. Give him some love as he comes up. Before this panel begins with the African Union, we have Cardinal Mbai Chui from the Shrine of the Black, came all the way from Detroit. Please stand up, Cardinal. Give him some love. When this great African leader heard about this summit, he said, whatever you want to have this summit, just tell me. Give him some more love for that. And the Shrine of the Black Madonna to open up their center for us. Prince Ram just stepped out. I'm quite sure he's going to be back. He's one of the speakers for today. He told me yesterday, whatever you need, Whatever the summit needs, just speak to the African Hebrew Israelite and they will get it. Give the African Israelite some love. That's right, Prince Ram. That's right. Well, we're going to... Brother Joe Beasley. Joe Beasley is in the house. Come on, please stand up. Rainbow Push Coalition and the African Ascension. Brother Joe Beasley, one of the most serious brothers in town here. Serious work in the community. That's right. Well, sometimes, okay, this is not a preference. Give Nana a preference of love of the UNA. That's right, in the, in the house. That's right. Not a preference. That's right. At this time, let's move forward with this African Union agenda. At this time, we will start out with Brother Ilambi Brown. Thank you very much, Brother Menelik. Brothers and sisters, comrades, and friends, I come to you today to uh, share with you some information I think is important. Anybody who's very serious about building an African Union, uh, this uh, year, 19, uh, 2006, is my 50th an uh, anniversary of working around Pan Africanism when we formed the AJS in 1956. During that time, I have been able to go to over 20 countries in Africa, North, East, South, and West, and all the time working around African nationalism, going through the ideas of Marcus Garvey and the 1959 Convention to get rid of the word Negro, and trying to build that into the Blackest Beautiful Movement, and all of these things that make African people understand why they would want to be African. The birth of Israel, uh, the Hebrew Israelite, I met in 1968 when they were in Liberia. When I came through there, of course, they had a good friend, we have a mutual friend who was, and I've been mentioned here, who plays a whole big role in this, and that is a Boomer Zika Sunny Carson. Uh, because, I didn't know. Well, I don't know, right. Okay. A Boomer Zika Sunny Carson, who by taking the remains of his uh, grand uncle back to Africa, got them to turn the door of return, of no return, back into the door of return. That was a very major movement for our, our particular commitment. Before I was listening, I didn't get a chance to be here yesterday, but I had came to leave without making a comment that one of the things that's very important too is what Amoko Cabral said in regards to culture. He said, before anything else, liberation is an act of culture. 
before anything else is an active culture. And we have to understand what that really means because at a time when in this particular country that African people thought, thought there was actually a dichotomy between the politics and the culture. We even put together a word called political culture, one word, because we don't think that you can have any kind of dynamic African uh, movement without having politics and culture brought together. Now one of the things that's very, very bad, and when Minister Memory put out his call, he talked about one of the things I think that's important, and if you don't understand this, we'll never be able to get it together. He talked about the fact that there were, uh, there was an attempt to put troops, U.S. troops in Ghana today. And what's so bad about that because what has happened now is that if you really understand what Kwame Nkrumah talked about when he talked about building a military uh, force for the whole of the continent, the United States government, since uh, the so-called war on terror, has been putting troops all over Africa, all over Africa, based on the fact that these, they are saying that the African countries are weak and therefore they need to have security. And what it is that the United States is now establishing for uh, position and basis in all of these countries saying that they need them there because Al Qaeda is coming there. And so quite as kept, even our uh, brother Museveni, you know, has two military contracts with the Pentagon, two military contracts. And we can't, uh, we can't, and I'm the one that introduced uh, Museveni in New York. Uh, when he came here, when he took power, we the ones that actually brought him to Harlem and introduced him to the people. And what they did uh, was scuttling the movement to restore the Congo back to what the Roma had, when the Rwandans and the Ugandans tried to, and eventually uh, got Laurent Kabila killed for trying to establish the kind of thing we're talking about today. And because I'm truthful, I'm candid, I, you know, I have no horse in this race that's not going to be benefiting by capitalism. We need to understand that we can't afford to allow our people to be killed anymore. <laughs> the, the kind of things that's going on now with genocide in Africa, we can't understand that. We cannot allow this to happen. Who are we? The Africans in the West. We are the original Come on now. African observer mission to the United States. That's who we are. We've been here for 500 years. We know everything they do. And people don't have to even go to academia to understand what is going on here. The people on the ground can understand. You can understand the connection between Katrina and the war in Iraq. Because the same people are doing it. And the same so-called mistakes they're doing are deliberate, calculated ways to actually destroy our people. And unless we come to grips with that and willing to deal with it, we will not be able to understand how we're going to get out of this thing because they intend to kill us. They intend to kill us. Right now, the idea of trying to bring NATO troops into Africa, this is what they're talking about, we're going to bring them into the Sudan. You know, they're saying they want to bring NATO troops because we don't have anything strong enough to actually deal coming from the African Union. But, if that's the case, the fact is that NATO, one of the smallest countries in Europe, but we don't understand how important that country is going back to the days of Leopold, when they actually killed over 10 million people under Leopold and made over 15 million dollars. So more countries like that became the master of a country 80 times its size. And when you look at, uh, when you look, start to look at um, Brussels, and look at Belgium, you don't realize how what, how strategic they are. They represent the economic and the military 
nexus of the white world. One, they are the headquarters of NATO. That's the military. And then they head up the economic union. So they always got benefits when Leopold was doing his view and allowing for all of these white corporations and white countries. And when they split Africa up in 1884, 1885, that's when they tore this whole thing apart. And we, I hope, are scattered here in the, in the West, have an inclusive role to play in restoring right. our people and bringing to them everything they need, including information. There's nothing we can say that will be beneficial to our people that we should not, uh, we should have a reason not to say. And that's why I'm saying that it's important to understand as an observer, you know, we talk about the observer mission to the United Nations, the observer mission, and that every African should understand that the most critical thing that's going on in Africa right now, not so much about the killing, but in the economic thing, is what's happening in Zimbabwe. Anybody, anybody that does not understand why they want to take out Robert Gabriel Mugabe, do not understand this whole thing about Pan-Africanism. Now, we also have a situation where the contradiction that is still tearing apart the Sudan is something we have to come to grips with. And I want to just read a little brief thing to you, because I think it's very important, because it just came out yesterday, and what it does, it puts a new spin on this whole thing about ginger wheat. This is from Afro News, which is an African news uh, uh, internet. Second March, a top militia leader says that the Sudan government backed and directed January activities in the northern Darfur, according to a videotape released today, widely, which is yesterday, widely regarded as the top January leader in Darfur, Musa Hilal, was interviewed over the course of several hours by human rights researchers in Khartoum, where he said he got his orders from the government. John Jaweed leader Hilal was interviewed by the New York-based group of human rights watch. I don't, I don't necessarily care for these human rights groups. I don't believe in these so-called NGOs that go around budgeting everybody's people. And we don't want to see, we don't want to see any more killing in the Sudan. That's what I'm saying that we have to deal with this because the Sudan was going to get the, uh, the OAMC and the African countries were not allowed. This was not allowed because there's too much going on that is not explained. You can't have people pillaging our, uh, their, their neighbors and actually killing and, and raping black women and say that we are safeguarding the role of pan -Africans. We can't. We just can't do that. I can't anymore. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be involved in nothing like that because <coughs> We said in 1962, which was a front page story on 63, on Muhammad Speaks that backed us about the black woman, the beauty of the black woman, and the virtue of the black woman, and therefore, we have to make sure that we can't have people running around raping our women and getting rid of them. Fact in the game because of what, of what Musa Hilal has said. Because the thing that saying the government is not doing that, and listen, I have been involved working around the Sudan since uh, 1968 when we first went there and talked to Al Imam Al Hayy Al Mahdi, the grandson of the Mahdi, Muhammad Ahmed, and his brother Yahya and sat on the, in, in Omdurman, on the roof of his house, talking to them about why we feel that this case has to be resolved. The Sudan 